Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Rambus with Stephen Wu, who's going to talk today about the difference of HBM2 and GDR6, particularly under workloads. Steve, everybody always wants the best and the fastest and the most expensive uh, uh, memory that's available. What's the difference here, though? Is it really a one-to-one -one comparison of HBM2 versus GDDR6, or is there more to it? There's really a lot more to it, Ed, and uh, a lot of it really depends on what your application needs. We find that some applications need a lot of bandwidth, and some of them need very low latency. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what some of those trade-offs are. Let's take a look. Sure. So, Steve, what's the difference in terms of real-world workloads between GDDR6 and HBM2? So it turns out that, uh, let me give you an analogy for, uh, that will help illustrate how these things differ and, and mostly how they compare against some of the lower bandwidth memories like DDR and LPDDR. So the analogy I'm going to give you is uh, traveling on roads from your home. Let's say you wanted to travel to the next city. So um, really the amount of time it takes you, the latency to travel uh, that, uh, to the next city, it depends kind of on how much traffic there is on those roads and how much traffic each of those roads can support. So let's say I'm at my home and I want to go someplace and I have two choices. I can have kind of a narrow road or a very wide superhighway. Well, in the dead of night, when there's no traffic, it'll take me about the same amount of time to get from point A to point B because there's nothing really stopping me. And so it turns out that uh, the, the amount of time it takes me will be roughly the same. But when there's a lot of traffic, it's a different story, so I can illustrate that. So I'm just by myself. It's really great. I can take whatever road is closer to my home, and that'll be the fastest route for me to get from point A to point B. But when I have a lot of traffic, it's a different story. A road that can't support a lot of traffic, that has low bandwidth, is more problematic. It takes me a lot longer to get from point A to point B. And that traffic can come from anywhere, right? It could be the uh, uh, connection into I.O. It could be the tra contention for resources within a chip. Uh, it could be the, the on-chip network and how things are moving around there, how much traffic you have there. That's right. So memory systems are really no different than this example of roads that I've given you. And what you pointed out is exactly correct. These different cars represent accesses to memory from the various things that could be on your SOC or in your computer system. It could be graphics, it could be I.O., it could be the central processor itself. And so what you care about is sometimes the application needs very low latency because you have to wait until you get that data. And if you're stuck behind a lot of traffic, your wait time can go up. But contrast that with something that's much higher bandwidth, something that supports a lot more traffic. If we had those same cars and trucks, It's actually much easier for you to have a fast path to get from point A to point B because you can support much more traffic on this road. And this is a situation that's much more like what GDDR6 and HBM allow. You can get from point A to point B much faster when you have a lot of load. And so applications like graphics and artificial intelligence, they have a lot of traffic that they're trying to support. And so the latency tends to stay low even under the heaviest amounts of traffic for those workloads. Is the speed per lane the same no matter which one you're using? So um, to first order it is, but you do sometimes get this interference that happens. And the way to think of it is uh, people on the highway that like to change lanes from time to time. And the more people you have that are frequently changing lanes, the more it can kind of block you and slow you down. Something analogous happens in memory systems where the various requests that are coming from graphics and the CPU and I.O., they might interfere with each other. And so if you don't have enough lanes, it can be hard for you to route your request quickly through the system. Now, in the case of a, a single lane road, you can imagine, uh, or a double lane road, you can imagine a car that's uh, swerving back and forth really blocks all the traffic after it. But if you had um, a multi-lane highway here, um, if you have one truck or car that is switching between a couple of lanes, you just simply go around them into another lane. And so you can get kind of from point A to point B much faster as long as you have more lanes. More difficult to big, build the bigger highway than it is the smaller one? It can be. Um, it takes more room and uh, it takes more resources to do something like that. And, but uh, there are benefits depending on your workload. So if you have a workload where um, you absolutely positively need the lowest latency 
and you're not really using, uh, there's not much traffic on the system, you can build kind of a narrower system, something like what you would see with DDR or LPDDR. But if you have a system where you have lots of requests into the memory system, um, something like graphics or artificial intelligence, you want something with a much wider kind of highway to support lots of traffic. Can you dedicate lanes as well? You can, and so um, some people actually do that in their systems. They may take some lanes and some resources in the memory system and say, these things are reserved for CPU traffic, and that would be analogous to like a carpool lane on a highway. Running along with your analogy here, sometimes if you're uh, trying to get onto a major highway, it's going to take you longer than it is to get onto a local road. What's the impact here? Yeah, it's a good question. So it really depends. Um, if there's no traffic, on either road, then really it's just easier for you to take kind of the lower bandwidth road that's closer to you. But if there's a lot of traffic, if it's rush hour, it's actually better for you to take just a little bit longer to get to the super highway because in the end you'll save so much more time on this road that it'll more than make up for the time it takes you to get onto that highway. What happens if you do something like flip a bit on the uh, DRAM? Does it, is it easier on one than another to solve or is it the same? Well, it, um, error correction is uh, solved in different ways in different systems. And so um, it's a little bit more complicated uh, discussion, but there are um, very good methods that are in use for both very wide, fast kind of memory systems as well as the more traditional kind of DDR systems. One of the things about AI chips is you're trying to get massive throughput. You've got multiple processors, you've got multiple onboard memories on chip, but you also have lots of external IOs into uh, different kinds of memory. D DRAM is, is certainly one of them. Um, does it matter if you're using multiple kinds of memories out there, or is it only one or the other? Yeah, we, we definitely see designs where there's some very high bandwidth, high performance memory, like GDDR or HBM, coupled with something that's a little bit lower bandwidth memory, like DDR. And that's because they support different kinds of traffic. So for the very high performance uh, traffic, uh, in a, like in AI systems where you're moving a lot of weights and a lot of uh, uh, training samples back and forth to your engine, you tend to move those in bulk very quickly and you'll tend to use the high performance memory. For communication with the rest of the system, um, you tend to use things like uh, more traditional DDR where you don't need as, as high a performance. If you're going into an automotive application, for example, you've got a lot of outside stresses. Um, you've got vibration, you've got noise, you've got uh, all sorts of things that can disrupt the signal. Does one fare better than the other simply because you have more lanes and more potential for insulation? Um, I mean, really, the, the kind of environmental stresses that the memories will undergo will be roughly the same. And so they'll be roughly the same kinds of things that you have to do. You'll have to make sure your vibrations are dampened, and you'll have to make sure that your um, shock and vibration testing is adequate for both kinds of memory systems. So you tend to test them under the same environments, and roughly speaking, you tend to kind of account for these things in similar ways. So DRAM is still DRAM, it's just a matter of how you configure that DRAM, right? That's correct, yeah. And it's really um, fundamentally how it's architected to support either very wide, high performance uh, in terms of the number of requests it can support, or something that's really designed for um, you know, a lower level of requests, but absolutely the lowest latency. So HBM can be stacked. It can go into uh, four layers and go into eight layers. What impact does that have on this? Yeah, so the way to kind of think of HBM is that um, each layer is already pretty high bandwidth by itself, but as you stack, it's almost like having a multi-tiered highway where you get a choice between which level of the highway you're driving on, and that adds even more resources and can support even higher amounts of traffic. Does it make it harder to configure and build? Well, there's certainly a manufacturing challenge of being able to stack these things. Uh, yield is harder to achieve, and you have to deal with um, the thermals. So heat gets trapped between the layers, and you have to find a way to pull it out. I guess there's some analogies in roads as well. It's more challenging to try and design a multi-tiered highway as well. But if you can do it, and if your system can tolerate all the environmental things like heat and uh, shock and things like that, you can definitely get much better performance. So let me recap and put this into perspective, Steve. What you're talking about here is not just latency, it's latency under load that's important, right? That's correct, yeah. So really, as an architect, you need to think about what your applications need. 
And so there's a certain level of bandwidth you're going to need, and you're going to need a certain latency under that load. As architects, we call that concept latency under load. And you study this with your applications to understand what you have to build in the memory system. It's very easy to think about what the latency of a memory device looks like when there's no load, when there's only a single request in the system. But real applications, especially demanding ones like graphics and AI, um, have lots of requests going on all at the same time. And what you're designing for there is both the bandwidth, how many cars you can move through in a given amount of time, or how many requests you can support in a given amount of time. And then what's that latency under load? Because those are the things that really matter. And does the processor choice matter in this as well? So one processor or one processor architecture is going to send out more requests and more data than another one? That's right. And so um, different processors can tolerate slightly higher, slight, slight differences in latency a little bit better than other processors can. So as you send a request um, down to the memories and you wait for the data to come back, if that processor has other work it can do, it can tolerate the latency. And so um, if there are differences in latency, then your processor architecture tries to make up for that and tries to make sure there's enough work to do in the meantime. So we've been struggling along with Moore's Law, trying to get more performance, more uh, uh, lower power out of each, each new node. This is a different way of looking at that same problem, right? That's right. And it turns out that electrical distances don't really change over time. So the speed of light is relatively fixed, and the distance that these memories sit away from processors is roughly the same. But the thing we can change is the bandwidth. And so we can keep adding more lanes. And historically, that's exactly what we've done as an industry. We've even come up with new memories that add more lanes and resources. And so by doing this, um, we now convert from being just a purely a latency-driven set of applications to applications that also demand bandwidth in that mix as a way to compensate for the fact that the latencies can't get much lower than they really are. So is one li likely to be more uh, better adopted and last longer than the other, or are they both pretty much the equivalent of they're, they're good for different tasks and each one's going to be around for a long time for specific things? Yeah, that's a good question. So here at Rambus, we actually design both kinds of memory systems and we see a tremendous need for both kinds of memories. In some systems, you need absolutely the highest bandwidth and absolutely the best power efficiency. And that's, uh, HBM is a great choice for that, but it's much tougher to design with from an engineering standpoint and it does take a little bit more cost in order to implement it. So if you don't have the design experience or you can't tolerate the cost, then GDDR is a, another great solution for you. It's kind of a compromise of many of those things, but it still gives you great performance and it still gives you a very wide um, pathway into memory so it can support high bandwidth. Stephen Wu, thanks for a great explanation. Uh, you're welcome, Ed.